today we will speak more about the usage and the application first about bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general and then we have a new topic which is altcoins so we will finish the first presentation about bitcoin and then uh, there will be um, evaluation of your reading tasks and uh, altcoins as new topic. so uh, we spoke about the blockchain the mining and the positional arms race which also concerns with the mining so that's what we did and today we will speak a little bit about trading bitcoin or uh, using it first question how can i get bitcoin uh you can mine it or or buy it yes uh, we, you can mine it you can buy it uh also you can earn it uh, you can get paid in Bitcoin. That's what uh, some people do. Uh, they get at least part of their salary in Bitcoin, which is quite interesting, I think. And uh, also you can ask somebody to give you a couple of Satoshi so that you can try uh, using it. When you want to buy it, you have two or three basic uh, options. One is um, buying it from an ATM, uh, which looks similarly to a normal ATM. Uh, you can insert cash and uh, provide uh, the machine with your address and uh, your address would be charged with the uh, appropriate amount of bitcoins. Um, this picture is from Parallel New Police in Prague or Shavitsa, where you would normally be able to go, but uh, because of the quarantine, of course, you can't uh, at the moment. And that would be similar with most of the uh, ATM. So there is another option, which is an exchange. Uh, are you familiar with Mt. Gox exchange? And that was the famous uh, exchange which got hacked uh, in 2014. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or, and or also, this exchange was manipulating the price of Bitcoin by the creator, by the director of the exchange. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, it is a very infamous one. Um, it was the most popular uh, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin exchange in uh, in the first stage. Uh, so uh, the the first really big hype of Bitcoin was in 2013 because there was a financial crisis in Cyprus, European Union, and uh, <clears throat> banks were closed uh, and. People lost their confidence for euro, for the fiat currency, and the price of Bitcoin skyrocketed for the first time noticeably. Uh, in fact, the, the first huge uh, jump in the price was uh, in 2011, uh, when uh, there was a Wikileaks um, case. Uh, Wikileaks is a web page uh, where Mm, Julian Assange, the owner of uh, of this project, published some secret dispatches of the American government, and the government uh, reacted in the way that they uh, persuaded Visa, PayPal, Mastercard to stop any trans money transfers uh, to support this mm, WikiLeaks. So the only way how uh, this project could keep being financing was by accepting Bitcoin. So that was in 2011 and it was the the, the biggest uh, percentual change in price, the biggest percentual rise in price uh, of Bitcoin up to the present day, by the way. So Mt. Gox was very popular uh, in 2013 and uh, <clears throat> first in March there was the, the Cypriot crisis and then in September uh, China adopted some uh, additional capital restrictions, uh, which prevented the Chinese people from uh, transferring their yuan into the US dollar. So uh, the Chinese or the richer Chinese used to hedge themselves using US dollar because uh, the price of renminbi, the, the Chinese yuan, was underrated, uh, undervalued. So they used uh, they used to use US dollar as a safe haven, <clears throat> but uh, now they couldn't. Uh, so they used Bitcoin as an intermediary asset. They bought Bitcoin with Yuan 
and then they uh, sold Bitcoin for US dollars. That's how they bypassed this regulation. And the price kept, go kept going up. Uh, now there are problems with Mt. Gox because probably the owners uh, of it tunneled it, <coughs> meaning that there are still some money that was there in the exchange. Uh, they didn't keep 100% reserves and uh, they tried to solve the situation by manipulating the price using robots uh, that would be trading with themselves and uh, the price of Bitcoin kept going up, but it was really a bubble. And uh, in the end of the year 2013, it was revealed that uh, there is not enough Bitcoins, that uh, they're faking their, uh, their volumes and uh, the, this whole <clears throat> Think crashed and it started the first huge Bitcoin crisis when the price went down for like two years. <clears throat> uh, so Mount Gox no longer uh, no longer exists. It was a Tokyo-based exchange, uh, but the CEO was a French guy. His name was Mark Carpoes. He was also persecuted, and uh, the Bitcoins uh, that were Mm, seized by the police in in this exchange uh, have been distributed back to the original owners um, until now, I think. Maybe not all of them have already been uh, given back to their owners. So uh, this is an infamous exchange, Mount Cox. Today we have different uh, exchanges. <clears throat> and uh, of course it is also possible to get fiat uh, back from Bitcoin. So it works both ways. Uh, great news. Um, one of the best exchanges, a US based Bitrex, uh, Bitrex Global, uh, started working with Euros today. Uh, so today, uh, or starting from today, it should be possible to buy Bitcoins directly on Bitrex. Um, using a uh, SEPA payment, as EPA payment. Uh, so for European clients, this is, this is great news. Uh, another uh, opportunity would be Bitstamp, uh, a Slovenian exchange located in London, or Kraken. Uh, this is another American option, how we can reach from uh, fiat to cryptocurrency. Uh, there are two types of exchanges. Some trade fiat for Bitcoin and some trade Bitcoin for altcoins or altcoins for altcoins. So uh, if, if you need to enter crypto, you need to use the first type of the exchange. An example would be virtual property. This is a Czech exchange uh, which was founded by one of my ex-students, now a colleague from the university. Uh, Sasha Madarasova. So this is this is her exchange. Um, an issue with these fiat to cryptocurrency exchanges is that they usually are quite expensive. But, meaning you, you would pay a couple of person, a couple of person uh, to do the transfer, which uh, is not such a big deal. Uh, if you take into account the volatility of the cryptocurrencies, but uh, if you're operating a lot of money, uh, it might be harmful. A great um, option was CoinMate, which is uh, another Czech exchange located in London. Uh, but last week, they, uh, their partner bank, Theo Bank, um, uh, stopped uh, the service. For them, so now they are without a bank, so there is no connection to fiat, and uh, we needed to get all the money quite quickly from CoinMate. There was something like a run on this uh, exchange. I might be a little bit uh, exaggerating, but it was really stressful uh, to uh, secure all the funds that we had there. So CoinMate no longer operates at the moment. Uh, Perhaps Bitrex will be a new opportunity, and there's always Bitstamp, Kraken, and these uh, smaller exchanges like Virtual Property or Instacoin. Um, of course, if you don't have 
that much money at stake in crypto, there are other opportunities like Revolut, Vibrex, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, also, you can trade cryptocurrency uh, OTC, meaning that if you find a partner that would accept your cash or your bank transfer and send you crypto, uh, you, you can do that. Uh, there are just two issues with that. Firstly, uh, it is illegal in the European Union to spend more than 10,000 euros in cash. So uh, 10,000 uh, for one transaction, that's the legal maximum. Uh, the other issue is that you need to find a really trusted uh, party. Why? Because Bitcoin transactions are irreversible. Once you sign an authorized uh, Bitcoin transaction, it cannot be reverted, while a bank transfer can be reverted. So if you get paid, even if you wait for the fiat to come into your account and then you send Bitcoin, your counterparty can change their mind and withdraw the money back, like to cancel uh, the transaction and you would lose your fiat uh, and the crypto. So there are pages like local bitcoins that will help you to find an OTC partner, but uh, I would be very cautious about it and I would recommend you to only trade OTC with people that you know personally and you can trust them. What can you buy with bitcoins? Uh, well, our prime minister famously uh, said four years ago, it's shocking for me. I have no idea what this is. Uh, as far as I know, nobody pays with bitcoin. Uh, so there was a graffiti near Parallelnipolis Polis in Holoshovice who made a campaign against the, uh, the prime minister for his ignorance and they invited him to this bitcoin uh, cafe and Andrei Babish came. And uh, it was documented, he made a, a purchase, he bought coffee or something with, with cryptocurrency. So now he knows that uh, what, what it is and, and how it can be used. Uh, to be honest, the, the governments, or at least the Czech government, uh, the governments are not very hostile towards cryptocurrencies. It's a famous legend that states, central banks and the banking sector in general hates cryptocurrencies and they are uh, afraid that uh, it could destroy them, but uh, I don't really have this feeling. It's just a, a legend that is being repeated over and over again. On the other hand, uh, it's really problematic to have an account uh, in a bank when you are doing uh, cryptocurrency business, especially when you are in exchange. That is exactly what CoinMate is experiencing at the moment. They lost their account just because they're a cryptocurrency exchange. Um, I don't really think that uh, this bank, these banks are afraid that uh, <clears throat> cryptocurrencies could drive them out of the business. No, uh, the problem is that the market is quite small. So they don't have much uh, or many incentives why they would um, accept these businesses. And they have a lot of compliance costs because there's a lot of regulation and national authorities are afraid that uh, cryptocurrencies could be used for money laundering, which they are to some extent, to be honest. So uh, that's why the banks are quite, quite cautious uh, and they are afraid of the regulation rather than of cryptocurrencies uh, themselves. What you can buy with crypto, well, pretty much anything. Uh, these are examples like you can pay education at certain universities, including here in Prague. Uh, you can buy uh, flight tickets, not at the moment, perhaps, but you could. Uh, food, uh, art and stuff. And you can even go to space because uh, Richard Branson, my favorite entrepreneur, the owner of Virgin Company, is a huge fan of cryptocurrencies and he offers uh, space uh, tourism uh, for people uh, and, and the people can also pay with bitcoins. And also there are services like Kishila, but Kishila does not uh, operate uh, anymore, but there are other, there are other options uh, that <clears throat> uh, allow you to uh, pay 
in cryptocurrencies for pretty much everything. They would just pay your bills and then you would reimburse them in crypto. So you can pay your rent in crypto, you can pay pretty much everything. How to trade Bitcoin? Uh, here uh, are some tips, uh, some general advices that I would give you. If you have more Bitcoins, uh, you should use multiple exchanges. Uh, just for case that one of the exchanges would be shut down, like CoinMate was last week. Uh, also, uh, you can have good relationships with people at these exchanges. It's still quite uh, a small small industry, so it's like a global village. Everyone knows everyone, so it's good to have friends at different exchanges. Uh, most important advice. It is very obvious. A very obvious advice about trading, but people continually fail uh, to understand it. You need to buy when the price is low and you need to sell when it's high. People always do the opposite. Most of the traders do the opposite. They are afraid when the price drops and they're selling it out of fear. And when the price is going up, they open the long positions and they are buying crypto out of greed. So it is intuitive, but absolutely stupid. The only way how we can earn money on trading is selling, is to sell when the price goes up and buy when the price goes down. This is something that you need to encourage into your brain because otherwise you should never trade. You should do the in-depth analysis of the of the market of the uh, exchanges. Watch uh, what prices uh, are uh, offered, um, <clears throat> because when you see the price at the moment, it's just the last price that was traded. No matter the sizes of the trade, but what is relevant is at which price people are willing to sell or buy at bigger amounts because that teaches you uh, where the market can move in a short run. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated because uh, some of the traders are faking their orders. Uh, they, they are building some fake walls of, uh, of offers uh, or orders and then they cancel it when the market moves the, uh, the desired way. But uh, as like the, the, the rule of thumb, uh, you, you should do the uh, in-depth analysis before uh, making some um, trades. What is arbitrage? Uh, this is when you simultaneously uh, buy and sell somewhere a crypto. So you, do, you don't have any risk at all in it. Mm -hmm. uh, could, your name, please. My name is Dmitry. Uh -huh. Sometimes it's difficult for me to guess uh, the name. So if you say something, it's better yeah, okay. uh, when, when you first say your name and, you know, we save time. We all save time. Thank you, Dmitry. Um, and Oliver, yes. Uh, prices might be different and different exchanges. So uh, it, Sometimes you can buy crypto uh, for a lower price at one exchange, then send it to another and uh, sell it at the other uh, exchange where the price uh, is higher. So that should be easy money. The problem can be with liquidity. Um, your transaction might get stuck uh, because first the exchange needs to approve it and then you need to wait for the miners to uh, accept your transaction and to put it into blockchain and uh, in the meantime you can lose some time and uh, the arbitrage doesn't have to work but uh, it is because of arbitrage because arbitrage exists or can exist that the exchanges have quite similar prices uh, only when an exchange is in troubles uh, the price might uh, differ significantly. And that is exactly because there are problems with liquidity, because it's more complicated to load or unload money to that exchange. 
fundamental analysis is very important when you are uh, making some strategic uh, trades or you are rebalancing your portfolio. Uh, last week, um, <clears throat> I recorded a presentation that I had uh, as a guest speaker for the other uh, course, Bitcoin in Business. Um, <clears throat> you have it uh, at disposal, so it is in the Dropbox uh, folder. Um, also, you were invited to see it, so I will uh, not speak about fundamental analysis no more. You can always see the record. Uh, of it, and I also uploaded the, the PowerPoint presentation to your Dropbox folder. <clears throat> Technical analysis um, follows patterns in the graphs. So, uh, it's based on the idea that you can guess uh, future events out of the past events. Um, it mostly works because uh, it is the self-fulfilling prophecy. A lot of people follow these patterns and they believe in it and that's why they uh, behave in accordance with them and uh, that's why technical analysis can be used somehow uh, to uh, improve the timing of your trades. Um, some traders base all their strategy just about technical, uh, just on technical analysis. I would recommend you to add some fundamental or sentimental analysis. Sentimental analysis is about feelings in the market. So there are uh, tools that, that tell you whether uh, FOMO is prevalent or uh, whether uh, <clears throat> uh, FUD, fear, uncertainty, despair, that's like. Uh, Fear, yes, um, is, is prevalent. So uh, that can also help you to time your trades. What would you think? Does the price of Bitcoin grow or increase with more companies accepting it for payments? Uh, my opinion is that, uh, I'm sorry, sorry uh, that not with uh, accepting more payments, but uh, by generating more payments. For example, if someone accepts it, but no one uses that way, then it's it's uh, not better for the price. But if a lot of people start using it, it generates some mm, transactions. It would be uh, making the price go up. Uh -huh. Yeah, it would make sense. This is a very good um, answer. Uh, thank you. Empirically, it's not so much true. Um, well, we can observe that with more companies accepting Bitcoin and really accepting the payments, as you suggested, uh, the prices are not that much affected, but the volatility uh, decreases. So if Bitcoins are more used as they were intended, perhaps as money, uh, than just a speculative asset, it should calm down the, the prices. Uh, we are not even close. Uh, to the stage where people would normally use cryptocurrencies for payments. If that becomes reality, uh, maybe uh, maybe it, it will help the price to increase. But I'm not really sure whether Bitcoin itself will ever be used as a medium of exchange. It's rather designed as a store of value. So... Uh, Maybe there will be other cryptocurrencies used uh, for, for paying. And uh, the fact is that uh, even if you buy coffee in, in some cafes that accept Bitcoin, um, most people, I'm, I'm not really sure about the most, but a lot of people use Litecoin. Uh, they prefer Litecoin because of lower fees and because the transactions are faster. So Litecoin won this position of the medium of exchange among cryptocurrencies, at least for buying these petty uh, purchases. What I would recommend is to invest in technology and people. That's like a fundamental analysis. You should uh, understand the technology. You should get to know the people, not personally, but you should know their background, whether they can be trusted. So even though cryptocurrencies are considered to be a trustless solution, uh, it's it's not really so. So in fact, still you need to trust a lot of a lot of people, a lot of uh, subjects like the exchanges, like 
uh, blockchain explorer providers, <clears throat> like the miners, not the miners that much. You know, that's the most trustless thing because there is a competition among the miners uh, and you can become a miner yourself. But you need to trust the public and the governments that they accept uh, cryptocurrencies that it, that it still will be legal. Cryptocurrencies theoretically might work even if it is illegal, but uh, most of the population would not use use it if it if it wasn't legal. So <clears throat> still, uh, everything is based on social relationship and trust in economics. Uh, Tommy asks a question. Do you think the price would become less volatile if Bitcoin was accepted for payments by more companies? Um, yes, that's, that's what I say. That's what I said. Um, I think that when cryptocurrencies are used more uh, for uh, normal payments, it, uh, the, the prices would stabilize uh, quite probably. And that's also what we could read from the graphs. I had these graphs prepared. Uh, I used it for a couple of years. Uh, not anymore, but we, we could... Uh, I, I put it off the presentation, but um, between the years 2014 and 17, we could definitely see uh, that the number of companies accepting Bitcoin is increasing uh, and uh, that the volatility was going down. But then there were some shocks uh, that increased volatility again. And uh, there are also companies that stopped accepting cryptocurrencies because uh, they had problems with their payment providers or because there was just not enough demand. So uh, it's quite it, it, it's quite difficult, honestly. And uh, it is extremely difficult to assess how uh, what, what is the volume of transactions used in real economy. Uh, that's what Zoltan suggested. It's more important to know how much money flows through these uh, gateways or through these vendors that accept Bitcoin, but we don't know that. We know the number of vendors are accepting Bitcoin, but not the volumes. Oliver asks, do you have special partnerships with Altlift to buy uh, trade crypto? See, uh, yes, we do. Yeah, Altlift is my company and uh, we have special partnerships uh, with uh, virtual property with Instacoin. Uh, and also, we uh, have uh, higher limits for trading at Binance and Bittrex, and we have uh, great limits at CoinMate. Unfortunately, we lost that. So now we are trying to establish some new ones, yes. So if you needed any assistance with that, uh, we can dis discuss it uh, privately later. Thank you. Uh, be aware of the existence of pump and dump schemes. Again, I talked about it. Uh, last week in the in the other class. This is how um, an interface of an exchange looks like. Uh, here you can see um, the in-depth analysis. So this is how much money or what's the volume of or cumula cumulative uh, volume of cryptocurrencies traded at this price. So uh, it's it's minimum, you know. Uh, so here you can see where some more reasonable uh, amounts or volumes of the asset is being uh, <coughs> traded. Here uh, is the price at which people want to buy. Here is the price of uh, for, for for which people want to sell. So the asks and bids. Um, you can also see it here with numbers, uh, this is more precise. And this is the graph. Uh, this is uh, this is buying, this is selling. C can you see the, the mouse, the arrow? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, now we see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. And th this is the graph of the price. Uh, these are so-called candles. When the camel is uh, green, it means that in the period of time, it can be like a minute, an hour, uh, a day, uh, whether the price went uh, up or down. So green means it started here and it moved here and, and so on. And uh, 
spread means the price was falling. Uh, <clears throat> there are some other more complicated patterns. This is called uh, J Japanese uh, technical analysis or, or Japanese candles. Um, so you can make your own research on the topic. And uh, I also think that um, in an hour, uh, Lubosch will have a guest uh, speaker for technical analysis. Perhaps it will also be recorded. So I try to ask him to provide it to you too. Uh, if the record does not fail. Yeah. Sometimes the records fail. Unfortunately, that's mm, that's the problem with Microsoft Teams. It works quite smoothly, as you can see, but sometimes the record is stuck. Uh, so, yeah, this is the example of the pump and dump scheme. So the price goes up very quickly when the project is new or something is announced. Uh, so when you see a very sharp price like this, uh, <clears throat> there's a great chance that it would be a pump and dump scheme. So definitely do not buy uh, anywhere here. Yeah, do not buy anywhere here. And uh, when the price goes down, um, you either wait for consolidation, but the consolidation should happen somewhere here or here. Yeah, uh, higher than when the, the price change. Uh, begun uh, because if the price uh, goes even lower than where it started, it's clearly a pump and dump scheme. And uh, again, uh, I recommend you never to base your trades solely on technical analysis. You should be aware of the fundamental whether there is some or not. What about the value? Does Bitcoin have any intrinsic value? Paul Krugman, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, said, uh, fiat money is backed by men with guns. Bitcoin is not. So why should this thing have any value? This is his real world uh, words. He said the dollar is great because there is the U.S. Army enforcing its usage. and Bitcoin doesn't have it. So uh, why should it have any value? What do you think? Does Bitcoin have any intrinsic value? And if yes, why? It's me, Dimitri. I think uh, the intrinsic value is like um, it based on what people believe. Uh -huh. You know, like uh, basically, I think Bitcoin has a zero in, in intrinsic value, but but because people believe in it, but because people want to buy it, so we we, we can see now that it trades like uh, I don't know, like. Uh, Six thousand two hundred sixty-three dollars. Like it's just based on people's belief. That's all. Mm -hmm. Good. Exactly. Fine. Any other idea? I think uh, the intrinsic value from the Bitcoin comes from the limited amount of number of coins you can have and the number of. Uh, Mine, mining, maybe because uh, they are generating the the backbone of the infrastructure, and if the the infrastructure is great, then it should have the the, the value for it. Ah, uh -huh. good, Zoltan, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, there are some advantage. We can even if we are not sure or we cannot calculate the intrinsic value, we can compare. Bitcoin with other alternatives, like with fiat. And uh, we can see that the money supply of fiat can be manipulated or manipulated. It can be increased quite easily. That's what's happening at the moment. And you cannot do that with Bitcoin. So if you uh, compare these two uh, alternatives, uh, you might think that, well, Bitcoin definitely has a better uh, intrinsic value than fiat. That's what you can think. Also, you can think that well, there is a lot of value in the mining machines and uh, it is useful uh, because it is secure or something. So that is uh, this value in utility. 
there are uh, three types of approaches how we can see value. There are demand theories, um, which are rather new. So they say, well, something has value because people want it, and people want it because it is useful. That's the neoclassical demand theory. Um, it was introduced in the late 90, uh, 19th century by uh, Karl Menger, uh, and it replaced the older supply theory of value. Uh, also, there is an interesting Hartmann theory. Hartmann says that something has value if it performs its functions. Like a car is good if it is fast, if it is cozy, uh, or if it is secure, or if the brakes break well. <clears throat> so that's the Hartmann theory of value. Supply theories of value are older. Uh, people believe that something uh, has value because uh, people spend a lot of time uh, creating it. So the value of labor is incorporated into, into it. Uh, that's what Adam Smith basically said. Uh, also, that's the theory that Karl Marx used. A new version is by an economist called Audum. So he says that um, energy is incorporated uh, into the value of things, and it can be energy from the sun, for instance, or uh, from the power plant. <clears throat> So uh, I might think, or people, some economists might think that these theories are obsolete, but empirically, it's all about psychology. Supply, demand, that's what creates the price, and uh, it's all based on uh, the will of people. When people are willing to buy something, uh, well, it doesn't really matter whether they believe in the supply theories or in the demand theories or whatever, Important is that they are willing to make the purchase. There is also a difference between exchange relations, which is the price, and intrinsic value, which is something invisible that is connected or related uh, to the product itself. And cryptocurrencies, or currencies in general, are a very specific asset because they measure value of other things. So uh, their value is mostly based on trust. And trust is autocatalytic. What it means? It means that if more people trust in something, uh, more people, even more people will trust it. So you need to trust the currency to accept it. And when you accept it, uh, then people trust that it will continue being accepted. That's exactly how a legal tender works. The government provides the trust by saying this will be accepted. And if not, uh, we will enforce it. And you don't really need to use the force. Uh, it's okay when you just say it and then people behave in accordance with that. I might have told you about Al-Ghazali's uh, theory. He was um, an Islamic thinker in the 11th century, like a thousand years ago. And uh, he said that <clears throat> money uh, should be only used for measuring value of other things. Because if it is used as a speculative asset, um, it is um, no longer able to portray uh, the value of other things. It would be like the funny uh, group mirror in, in the theme park that shows you with a long neck and you're fat or something. So it is a distorted uh, picture of reality rather than a photo of reality. How can we recognize that something is a bubble? Bubble is a situation when uh, an asset is traded for a higher price or significantly higher price uh, than what its intrinsic value would suggest. Could you explain how we can recognize it? I, uh, David, I guess it's uh, because the uh, internal uh, value, I don't know if it's good in English, uh, is uh, much uh, lower than the price. Yes, but how, how can you assess or how can you calculate this in intrinsic value? 
So intrinsic value is calculated by taking the probabilities and risk and returns, right? In case of the stock, dividends and the uh, interest rates. Mm -hmm. Wonder when the majority of the people are purchasing the same commodity, then it might be the case that, that uh, it might, we might anticipate the variable. Uh -huh. uh, who's uh, your name? Same thing, Gela. Uh -huh. Gela, thank you. Um, good. Uh, this is what you can do when you are assessing prices of assets. Uh, that uh, you can see accounting documents of the company, dividends, or whether it entered some new markets and stuff. Uh, it's more complicated with uh, cryptocurrencies because they are not bringing any revenue. Um, in most of the cases, Bitcoin does not give you any dividends. Uh, so you, you need to find or search for different fundamentals, and it's a little bit more uh, fuzzy. <clears throat> I agree with that. Uh, also, uh, Thomas writes, increased price with nothing backing it up. Yes, that is definitely suspicious. Uh, Oliver, uh, when it's in the media and everyone buys it only because they think uh, it goes up without thinking about it. Uh, exactly. This is the uh, greater fool approach. You're buying something just because you believe that you will be able to sell it to a greater fool in the future. Uh, I like to explain a bubble or this uh, greater fool theory using a Jewish joke. So uh, there are two Jewish merchants and uh, one is selling candles. And uh, the other one says, well, the candles are very cheap. I, uh, I would gladly buy them. But uh, I checked those and they have no wicks. You cannot, it's just the wax. You cannot light them. Uh, and uh, the other merchant says, do you want to light the candles or do you want to sell them? So that's exactly the, the point. If you buy something without the utility, uh, you don't believe in it, but uh, you think that you will find another buyer, it's a bubble, clearly. Question is, is it a bubble when people store value in cryptocurrency? What if people are buying Bitcoin because they are afraid that the price of fiat will decrease? I would say this is utility. Uh, if you compare fiat and crypto and you think that crypto is a better store of value, uh, that's what, that's what is it, it is supposed to do. So I, I don't think that it is a bubble in this case, but uh, we always uh, we can only be sure in the future when we see today as a past event and uh, we see that yeah, the price went up and then it went down. It's very easy to say it was a bubble. But when we are in the bubble, we cannot, of course, use this approach because we cannot see in the future. And uh, yeah, Dana says, no, it's it's the same uh, with gold. Yes. And the, the only difference here, again, when we use this comparative analysis, uh, is that gold has been proven by uh, aeons of time. Tell me, it may be hard to differentiate when people are truly storing value in crypto. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. Bitcoin classification table. So comparison uh, between euro as a fiat currency and Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin substance is protocol. It means that there is a fixed set of rules or rather fixed set of rules. Uh, which is in the computer program saying how Bitcoin works uh, while Euro is consensual. The way Euro works uh, is only dependent on the deliberation of people. And there is no monetary authority in Bitcoin. Nobody can create uh, new units of it. Only nobody can decide that now the speed at which these coins are created uh, will increase or decrease. Carriers are the, the wallets, the so-called cryptocurrency or e-wallets. <clears throat> Monetary unit is one Bitcoin, uh, which is divisible to 100 million Satoshi. So Satoshi is like uh, Euro cent, 
uh, when you write about Bitcoin, um, the unit, like the money, is with uh, lowercase, small b, while uh, the project, the protocol, the system, the network is Bitcoin with uppercase, with capital B. Transmission system is a blockchain, which is an accounting ledger, uh, a specific accounting ledger called blockchain. Institutions are the miners, and you can also say that there are other institutions that are needed for maintaining uh, the network, like exchanges, the full nodes, uh, the uh, blockchain explorer providers and stuff, uh, developers maybe. There is no collateral, so there is no asset with fixed exchange rate with Bitcoin. That's uh, the same with euros. Uh, creation is mining, and there is no termination uh, of Bitcoin. Uh, it's, it is true that some people lost their uh, private keys. So access to some proportion, some part of Bitcoins uh, that have been mined, uh, has been lost. So now it is assessed uh, or assumed that around one quarter of all bitcoins, so like four million something bitcoins, have already been lost. Nobody will ever be able to use them again. But uh, we don't have precise data. It is quite impossible to. Uh, distinguish between the situation when somebody lost access to the bitcoins and the situation when the same person does just just holds uh, crypto, meaning that they don't move it, even though they could, but they don't want to because uh, it's their savings for retirement or something. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mitri wrote me that I recommended these quiz ups and they don't work. Uh, I I haven't checked, uh, to be honest. Uh, I'm, I don't even know what the quiz ups uh, or quiz up uh, operates uh, anymore. So uh, I'm I'm not really sure. If if it doesn't, uh, thank you, Mitri, for noticing me. Uh, I I would have to uh, uh, raise this this slide. Questions? Is there anything you want to ask before we move to the other part of the presentation? Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, XRP cryptocurrency as I'm writing a um, research paper about this. So mm -hmm. I, I, have, I have one question regarding monetary authority. So mm -hmm. uh, in my research, I studied that uh, Ripple uh, company mm -hmm. issued all the XRP tokens, but mm -hmm. uh, this is just a, little, a limited uh, quantity of these uh, tokens. This is uh, one, uh, one, one trillion or something like this. So no new tokens uh, can be um, issued. So mm -hmm. in the table of, uh, of, of analysis, I should write that monetary authority is a Ripple company or this is uh, or th there is no m m monetary authority. What do you think? Mm -hmm. This is a very good question. Uh, one thing is to put the table into your uh, term paper, which you should do. The other thing is that you should explain it. Yeah? So you should mm -hmm. also provide, provide some additional uh, text. And the situation with XRP, which is the currency of Ripple, is, is this. It has been pre-mined. Some cryptocurrencies are mined, like Bitcoin. So in the Genesis block, in, in the beginning of the blockchain, there are no coins and they are mined. So uh, with every block, new coins are released to the network. Pre-mined coins uh, are released, pre-distributed uh, in the Genesis block. but uh, Ripple apps kept uh, more than half of uh, all the, the XRPs in the beginning when they started, uh, 2011, 13. Uh, I don't remember the year. I know that Ripple uh, as a system is older than Bitcoin. It's 2006. Uh, but uh, the, the, the cryptocurrency token, which is added to that, 
is a little bit newer, but still it's one of the oldest cryptocurrencies. 2011, 12, 13, something like that. Uh, so they keep, even today, they keep like 60% of all the money supply. And uh, that's why we differentiate between total money supply and circulating money supply. So if Ripple Labs, the company, owns 60% of Ripples, it's part of the total supply, but not of the circulating supply. And they are able to increase the circulating supply by uh, giving away uh, their holdings of XRP, which they do. They use it for financing their operations. They use it to incentivize banks uh, or other partners that would use their networks. They have a couple of networks and they, um, their target client is the banking sector. So they keep releasing these coins. So on one hand, uh, it's being pre-mined and all the XRP tokens uh, have existed since the Genesis block. On the other hand, it was not part of the circulating money supply and it's being released by Ripple Up. So I would say that in this case, both uh, answers would be correct that the monetary authority is ripple ops or there is no monetary authority, but um, definitely you have to explain it. Mm. Thank you for the question. Okay, I got and, uh, it. Thanks. Yeah, welcome. Uh, Jana, when we buy on Forex, how do we differentiate if the value of Bitcoin is growing or the USD is decreasing? Uh, good question. Firstly, Forex. Uh, is fiat or exchange, yeah, foreign exchange, meaning you exchange pounds sterling for Russian ruble, for instance. Uh, so cryptocurrencies are not listed on Forex. They have their own exchanges. Um, how can we differentiate between bit price of Bitcoin growing or uh, price of dollar decreasing? Well, uh, I would look at inflation, for instance. So when the price of dollar is decreasing in terms of what you can buy with, uh, is decreasing in terms of things you can buy with it, uh, I would say dollar price of dollar is decreasing and uh, nothing happens to the price of Bitcoin. Uh, but if you can buy more things with Bitcoin, in real terms, like you can buy a Lombo uh, for 10 Bitcoins, and in a year, you still can buy Lambo for 10 Bitcoins. Uh, it means the price of Bitcoin is stable. It's not increasing. It's just the price of dollar decreasing. Uh, but if in a year you can buy Lambo for two Bitcoins, it means that the price of Bitcoin is increasing. That's how, would, how I would approach this. But uh, there is no clear methodology. Uh, I think that uh, similarly, you could look at Forex. So if the price of, I don't know, Czech currency is decreasing um, in terms of US dollars, the exchange rate of Czech crown is increasing, meaning uh, there is a depreciation of Czech crown. Uh, we should be able to see it even on the prices of goods in Czechia, but not necessarily, not necessarily. Sometimes there is no inflation and still the exchange rate, uh, the terms of trade change. So that's that's complicated. It's a dynamic system with a lot of degrees of freedom. Any other question? Okay, thank you. Uh, let's start the other, other part of the presentation. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Amazing. Good. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with reading evaluation, then we talk about uh, altcoins. First question, what is the daily decrypt?
yes, it is a YouTube channel. Uh, it was a podcast or a newscast on cryptocurrencies that broadcasted five times a week. Um, and it was brought by Amanda B. Johnson, which is the anchor woman. Uh, and it's not being broadcast anymore, as far as I know. Who sponsors the show? I think it was BitShares at that, that time, but I think a number of other projects had sponsored it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. This particular show was sponsored by BitShares, uh, but uh, their business model was to be sponsored by uh, whomever wanted. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that, that's really important to know. Uh, because if you accept money from somebody, you would promote uh, their services. So um, that applies to all the information that you got about cryptocurrencies. Everyone is biased, full stop. Everyone, including me. Yeah, I have my business in crypto. I have some agenda of mine. I try to be very honest uh, with you in explaining what, what I believe, but still these are my opinions and you should build your own opinion because everyone is somehow biased some people prefer bitcoin only some people prefer altcoins um <clears throat> i prefer bitcoin but also i'm very enthusiastic about altcoins that's why my company is called altlift because we invest into altcoins so just uh notice that that uh you should always ask uh, who sponsors the show or who uh, is behind it or what agenda uh, do they do they follow yeah. uh, when this was sponsored by BitShares which is an old coin of course they would be more critical to Bitcoin than uh, if, if, if it was sponsored by uh, some Bitcoin foundation what issues connected to Bitcoin does Amanda mention in the, in the show? Uh, David, uh, I would say that the main issue was the unconfirmed transaction. Mm -hmm. 30,000 of them. Mm -hmm. Yes, so there were a lot of unconfirmed transactions. Uh, the network was slow, it was not able to uh, proceed with that, that uh, much demand for Oh, that strong demand of transactions. So the mempool uh, of on unconfirmed transactions uh, grew. Um, Bitcoin has slowest confirmation time in comparison to all other 5,000 cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is the slowest one. Uh, it has the least uh, clear governance process. It has least functions. Uh, no protection against double spend. No, I would not agree. Bitcoin has protection against double spending. Uh, that, that's exactly what, what it does. That's uh, that's the invention that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto came up with. How to prevent double spending without having to rely on a trusted third party. Yes, yeah, she she might say something like that, uh, but that's that's completely bullshit. Uh, I don't know of. Double spend. Bitcoin has been with us for 10 years and uh, <clears throat> there are no significant double spends uh, ever. Development funded by fiat, not crypto. Well, yes, uh, but uh, again, that only applies to a certain extent because uh, a lot of the developers are paid in crypto. So, How many altcoins are there? Any idea? I said it, by the way. Currently, or uh, uh, at the time, at this video. Uh -huh. um, because currently, I think it's around 6,000. Yes, it's it's almost 6,000. It's more than 5,000. And when the video was new, it was like 1,500 or something. And we are only talking about uh, cryptocurrencies that are listed. Uh, at some exchange, there are more, like your activity points. It's a, it is a cryptocurrency, but it is not listed or at any exchange, uh, so it's not at Coin Market Cup. Why was one coin a scam? Because it didn't provide uh, 
a, a, a cryptocurrency at all. There was no uh, decentralization. Uh, there, there was no, uh, there was no, no, uh, not a blockchain at all, and uh, it was built on a Ponzi scheme pyramid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Good. It's, Good. it's uh, Dimitri. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You already have three points uh, today, Dimitri, but you can keep uh, commenting uh, because you have valuable insights. So thank you. Um, yes, it was a Ponzi scheme, a pyramid scheme. Good. Zoltan, uh, it it had uh, guaranteed profits, which is uh, mm -hmm. already a, a bad sign, and yes. uh, it w wasn't based at a, on a public ledger at all. Yes, yes, they used some kind of uh, blockchain proposal, uh, but it was a technology uh, that had been abandoned two years uh, be before OneCoin started. So there was some kind of masquerade for. Uh, cryptocurrency but it, it was all fake i've read also an article on bbc about uh, one coin scam about uh, crypto queen uh, the the woman who was in the head of one coin mm -hmm. and in yeah, that her, article, her name was Ruyeva. she was uh, maybe, I, I don't yeah. actually remember i just remember the the name a crypto queen and mm -hmm. uh, in that article it was told that all the scheme was built on a net uh, network marketing something like that that they hired a guy who's a professional in the marketing sphere and uh, that's how like they were getting new invest investors in, in, into the, the scheme and they were uh, pulling the, the, the money in in one coin Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, that that uh, woman, a crypto queen, uh, she was traveling a lot. Uh, she was given a conferences and so on. And just one day, she just d disappeared, and no, and nobody knows where where she where, where she is. I, I think that she's in jail. I think that she was arrested later. Uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, her her name was I don't remember her first name, but the family name was Ruyeva, and she was Bulgarian. As uh, some other, uh, and by the way, the, the the website of OneCoin still uh, still exists, and they they have like the 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 address is in Bulgaria, and it's not closed. I was pretty surprised seeing mm -hmm. that, but it's, it's it still exists. That, that that is interesting. That is interesting. Okay, let's move on. Uh, what is an ASIC proof algorithm? Uh, David, it's uh, an algorithm uh, mentioned in the coin Ethereum, and uh, it uh, allows people to mine uh, without expensive hardware. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, the, the, the hashing functions or the proof of work is ASIC resistant, <clears throat> so you cannot build uh, a specialized circuit only for performing this function. Uh, so it shouldn't discriminate between computers, as Pablo says. Um, but people are very clever, and they um, invented rigs. Rig, a rig uh, is a set of uh, GPUs, graphic cards. So you have a machine that, uh, and that you connect a lot of uh, graphic cards in parallel so that it looks like you are using more computers, you are more people, but in fact they are performing the same task. So um, <clears throat> a rig is something quite similar to the ASIC and it's the, the way how to bypass this ASIC proof algorithms. What is solidity? I don't think if I know the uh, correct answer, but uh, it was mentioned in Ethereum, and uh, it was like equipment which was, was uh, the Ethereum was hacked, but uh, I'm not sure what it is. Mm -hmm. 
No, I think Solidity is the programming language for smart contracts and Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. It's it's a Turing complete language designed for Ethereum smart contracts. Uh, Turing complete language means that uh, you can pretty much code everything uh, you can imagine. Um, if you can imagine it, you can you can code it and you can perform it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a little bit complicated for the developers because they need to learn um, new language, but it is quite similar uh, with JavaScript, which is very common. So uh, it's not such a big deal. There are hundreds of thousands of developers on Ethereum already on, which, uh, who are familiar with Solidity. What is proof of importance? It's an algorithm based on proof of stake, uh, but uh, not only uh, uh, having to prove the ownership, like in, in proof of stake, to how much crypto you have, but uh, <clears throat> how much do you use and how many people are you transacting with? Mm -hmm. Yes, so it is uh, a NEM. NEM is one of the cryptocurrencies I will tell you about today. Um, Lem's answer to proof of stake. Proof of stake is another consensus. So in proof of work, you need to have these ASICs, these rigs, these strong computers that consume a lot of electricity and it is uh, unecological. Uh, so uh, proof of stake rewards you for having the coins rather than having the machines. But the logic is very similar. Uh, if you have invested into the coins, uh, you would uh, not want to harm uh, the network, the, the trust for the cryptocurrency by performing any illicit actions, any um, <clears throat> any wishes, actions like trying to double spend. Uh, because if you do, you would lose your stake. You are putting your your stake at stake. Uh, so that's, that's the idea. Uh, but uh, the critique towards proof of stake is that it's making the rich richer. If you are already rich, you have a lot of coins, uh, you would mine more coins. Uh, so it's making the rich richer. So proof of importance gives some importance to transactions that you do, how active you are in the network, whether you are using the money for, for transacting and stuff. So uh, <clears throat> it's, it's an improvement to proof of stake. And yes, it is environmentally friendly. It doesn't require much electricity. Uh, the same applies to all proof of stake uh, systems. There are also uh, proof of stake systems that combine proof of work with proof of stake, uh, like Peercoin uh, or Ion. What is Eigentrust Plus Plus? Uh, I'm Linda. Uh, I think it's a kind of a program or application for node reputation. So it actually shuts down the spammers. Yes, perfect. Mm -hmm. It's a reputation management algorithm. Good. Uh, to, to prevent or to protect the network from spammers. Um, you can imagine it somehow like um, Uber. When you, when you are giving the reputation, the stars to your driver, so that the others know whether he or she is trustworthy or not. What is mosaics? It's a system for making your own altcoins easily. Some cryptocurrencies offer this on the other names like Waves. Waves also offers you the, the, the chance to create your own tokens very easily. Um, Mosaic is the name that uh, NEM uses. Uh, Bitcoin, for instance, uses a build-on app called Coin Prism or Colored Coins. Uh, so you can even... Uh, do that on Bitcoin, even though you heard that Bitcoin has primitive functions, um, but uh, they are layers built upon Bitcoin that offer you more functions. 
We have 20 more minutes, so let's see how fast we can be. What is an altcoin? Altcoin is every cryptocurrency but Bitcoin, an alternative coin to Bitcoin. There are literally thousands of them, more than 5,000. Uh, how is it possible? Bitcoin uses an open license called X11, which is similar to Creative Commons, meaning that everyone can copy uh, the code, uh, change it, use it even for um, business purposes or profit-oriented uh, purposes. That's the difference between X11 and Creative Commons. Um, Bitcoin represents over 65% of all cryptocurrencies market capitalization. So Bitcoin itself is like two thirds of the market. All the thousands of cryptocurrencies are uh, uh, irrelevant, speaking of their size. There are some relevant coins in the top 100, uh, but Bitcoin still, or the, the price of all Bitcoins combined, makes two-thirds of all the market cap. Um, there is another term used for altcoins, which is shitcoin. That's what the Bitcoin maximalists use. They say, Bitcoin maximalists say that Bitcoin is the only currency that should exist in the universe, and everything else is just scams. Uh, if there are altcoins that uh, provide some extra functionalities, it's only things that have been tested on Bitcoin but then refused. So. Uh, the universe only wants one currency because it is uh, easier to understand it. Uh, I personally, and this is my point of view, you can you can think that Bitcoin maximalism is absolutely cool. I have uh, I have no problem with it, but my personal stance is that um, it's better when the currency specialized for a certain function because you cannot. Uh, specialized for everything. I spoke about it last week and also uh, we will have a class uh, just about uh, parallel currencies uh, where I will explain this, this position. Uh, this is how coin market cap looks. Uh, it's a list or it's a, uh, it's a portal uh, showing or listing cryptocurrencies uh, the default listing uh, is according to the market cap. Uh, so this is today, uh, like one hour ago. Uh, no, this is two years ago. This is uh, three years ago, or fall 2017. And there only were uh, uh, there only were uh, 1,500 uh, currencies. Bitcoin dominance was just 40 percent. So it was less than half. Uh, the fall of 2017 was a time of altcoins. Uh, and you can see that uh, after Bitcoin, the second strongest cryptocurrency was Ethereum, followed by XRP Ripple, Bitcoin Cash, which is a fork of Bitcoin, Litecoin, Neo, Cardano, Stellar, EOS, Monero, Dash. So these are the currencies that exist uh, even today. So nothing changed. Uh, that much. This is uh, this is today uh, today morning. Uh, th there are some new uh, cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is still followed by Ethereum and XRP, but on the first place there is a stable coin called Tether. Um, every time uh, prices fall, uh, people are escaping into stable coins. I will explain it later today or uh, next week when we don't have enough time. <clears throat> so. Tether now is the fourth strongest cryptocurrency. There is still Bitcoin Cash, uh, another fork of uh, of it of Bitcoin Cash, which is Bitcoin Satoshi Vision. Litecoin EOS still there. Binance Coin didn't exist in 2017. Tezos also a new new thing. Unicell Leo. I I don't even know what this is. I don't even know what this is. Uh, and Monero uh, as an anonymous cryptocurrency ranks 12. And what is the purpose of altcoins? I would say that 95% of altcoins are just copycats of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency and they're basically scams. The only purpose is to uh, to make money for the developers or the you know, owners of, of the brand. <clears throat> and there are lightweight coins. They say, well, Bitcoin is uh, its very difficult to mine it and it's slow and you need to wait 10 minutes and blah, blah, blah. So we can do exactly the same thing, but it would be faster and cheaper. And I don't know, you don't need to consume that much energy. 
So examples would be Litecoin, Dogecoin, anonymous coins like Monero. Bitcoin is pseudonymous, it is not anonymous. So uh, anonymous coins, they work differently with the blockchain so that uh, you don't know uh, the addresses uh, that uh, you, you know neither the address of the sender not the recipient of the transaction uh, which uh, gives you true anonymity inflationary coins uh, some people or economists in general believe that inflation or mild inflation might be a good thing so some coins um, have a built-in uh, inflation so uh, which, which will last forever it will not end in 2140 like with Bitcoin, but it will continue forever. Um, why not? National coins. It was an experiment. Uh, it started in Iceland with Aurora coin uh, 2013, I think. Um, <clears throat> there was this financial crisis in uh, Europe or in some countries in Europe, like Cyprus, like Greece, like um, uh, Iceland. And... Uh, <clears throat> This was like Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency that does nothing else than Bitcoin, but it was distributed uh, to the citizens of a nation. The, the first experiment was uh, in Iceland and uh, the target here, or the, the, the aim was to provide the nation with liquidity, with money uh, that would be created without debt. It's easy to make money, but in fiat, when you create money, you also create debt. Yeah, you learn that. And uh, with cryptocurrency, you, you don't create this debt, so it should have helped the economies, but of course it didn't. What people in Iceland did after having received these coins was that they sold it immediately. So it was a typical pump and dump scheme, even though maybe it was not uh, the, the, the plan of the offers of Aurora coin and these other coins, uh, it's what happened. Egalitarian coins. These these coins believe that uh, the distribution of money in Bitcoin is uneven. Uh, it is unequal. Like it's with it's like with dollar. The richest one hundred percent, uh, richest one percent owns ninety nine percent of all the wealth and stuff. So uh, these coins typically uh, NAM uh, pre-distributed the coins more evenly. Innovative coins. Uh, this is the most interesting uh, altcoin. These are the most interesting altcoins because they bring some new technology, some new ideas. Question, David. Uh, when it is anonymous, uh, it means that coins are not. Does it mean that coins are not based on blockchain like Bitcoin? Uh, this is a very good question. Thank you, David. Uh, they are based uh, on blockchain, but the blockchain is not as transparent. Uh, so you can see all the transactions, yes, you can see it, and uh, there are other uh, protocols or other algorithms that uh, that make sure that uh, the transaction was signed, that uh, everything uh, works smoothly, nobody tampered with the history of the blockchain, but still you cannot see uh, the, the addresses of the sender and of the recipient. Uh, there are a couple of um, zero-knowledge proof algorithms that are used uh, in cryptocurrencies. For instance, Kryptonite uh, <coughs> is used uh, in, in Monero, uh, but th there are others. Uh, today, I am afraid I will not have time, so next time I will explain, for instance, how Dash works. Dash is an example of an anonymous coin, and uh, it, it should be quite clear how it, how it works. Case coins, they are connected to, uh, to a case, to a, uh, an agenda. Like, if you buy this coin, uh, it will help uh, marijuana business in the United States or if you buy this green coin it will save the planet and the oceans from plastic I don't know um, I, I think that these case coins are just scams or, or crappy projects uh, but I might be proven wrong
she says they just do bad mouth Bitcoin. I, I, I can, uh, at the protocol level, and it offers zero protection against double spans. Uh, I don't know what she means by that. I don't, I don't know what she means by that. But may, maybe she's just bullshitting because it was paid by uh, BitShares. But Bitcoin definitely offers protection against double spending. That, that's clear. That's, that's exactly what Bitcoin does. Uh, coins connected to service. It can be like Binance coin. Binance coin is one of the best coins, I would say. Uh, they are connected uh, or related uh, to Binance, which is the most popular cryptocurrency uh, exchange, altcoin to Bitcoin uh, exchange. Mm. Now they also have some fiat. And if you have uh, this Binance coin, uh, or if you make it the trades in Binance coin, um, you have lower fees. So it's a cryptocurrency for traders, saving costs, definitely. So it clearly has a fundament. Yeah. Uh, there are other <clears throat> um, examples, like you create a platform, and uh, which is really great. Everybody wants to use it. You have an amazing app, uh, an amazing app. And uh, that is, um, if you want to make any in-app purchases, you need to use this coin which drives the demand for the coin. That's, yeah, that, 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 that is the utility. Uh, you use the coin because you have to, if you want to use the service, uh, which it is bound to, like, uh, yeah, it absolutely, absolutely makes sense. Then there are uh, fiat friendly coins like XRP Ripple already mentioned, platforms for creating other coins. To some extent, this is also Ethereum. Uh, you can create uh, ERC-20 tokens on them. Uh, Waves is a good example. Now, so it means if there is a scam in a blockchain, uh, only thing you can do is just cancel it because you cannot find that bad miner. If there is a scan on blockchain, only thing you can do is just cancel it. I don't, I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. I don't even know what it relates to. If it relates to the anonymous coins like the the, the, the kryptonite, uh, no, you, you cannot cancel it. No, uh, you, you cannot you cannot change the history of a blockchain. No. Uh, Blockchain doesn't work in, in the sense that it allows you to um, to find scams when you go through the history. Uh, when something gets into blockchain, it stays there forever, no matter whether this is a scam or not. That was the discussion between Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Uh, next time we will discuss it. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, when something gets into the blockchain, it is the truth. It is the... Um, it is what the users agreed upon. It's the version of reality that is considered to be truth. Um, so the protection comes up front. There is this uh, Satoshi uh, or Nakamoto consensus uh, that prevents uh, cheaters from, let's say, participating in the, in the mining. Yeah, so th that's the same thing with Monero uh, Dash or with uh, these anonymous uh, cryptocurrencies. You cannot change uh, the blockchain. And then there's interoperability. <laughs> there are thousands or hundreds at least of blockchains and they don't communicate with each other. They don't communicate with each other. Uh, so interoperability projects uh, try to connect blockchains uh, one uh, with another so that they can communicate. The first, um, let's say, trial or first um, attempt to do it was called SuperNet. Uh, it was designed by uh, developers of NEM. Uh, today we have Polkadot, we have Cosmos, we have Ion, uh, we have more interoperability um, projects. 
four more minutes. So uh, this is an introduction to your homework. What does a blockchain do? What does a blockchain do? It allows to hold and transfer value in a digital form without having to rely on a trusted third party. This is the innovation that, uh, that I speak about all the time. Yeah, this is the distributed decentralized consensus. It provides an immutable ledger, an immutable database. Um, <clears throat> so once something enters the blockchain, it stays there. Um, blockchain is a linear chain of transaction and uh, every block is pointing at the hash of the previous block. So if you make a change here, the hash would change and this uh, next block would not point at it. So everyone will recognize that somebody tried to trick the history, to temper with the history. So it provides an immutable database. And also, also it solves the ego of participants on a project. <clears throat> so um, if, I don't know, five banks are trying to build a common database, uh, they would need to decide which bank would uh, be in charge of it. Uh, would it be Deutsche Bank? Would it be Santander? Would it be HSBC? Who knows? It's about ego. Yeah, no, no bank would want their competitor to be in charge. So, uh, using a decentralized um, solution like the blockchain uh, or any DLT distributed ledger technology, they can just put aside this this question: Who will be in charge? Nobody, because it is decentralized. Now you need to ask yourself a question. Do you need it? Does your project need any of this? You should never try to implement blockchain just because it's cool or because it sounds good or because it's modern. No, you, if you want to solve some, uh, one of these three issues, then maybe DLT blockchain would be your solution. Crypto economics has two pillars. One is technology that I described last time, that's the encryption. And then there is the economic motivation of the nodes. Because in order to have a functional blockchain, you have to have enough motivated and independent nodes and miners. And that's why you have this virtual coins and mining. Imagine Bitcoin is just an immutable uh, unchangeable database, which is a great thing. So you can write there um, something like, uh, let's say you marry a person and you want uh, the marriage to be written into the blockchain because it stays there forever. It's absolutely romantic, right? Uh, so you need such a database. It's not just for money. It's for storing any data. But what Bitcoin does is that it rewards you with a valuable coin for mining, for providing this decentralization, this infrastructure. That's it. So in many uh, decentralized public chains, you need the coins as a reward for motivating the nodes. Because otherwise, if you only have like three, four nodes and they're interconnected, what you have is an extens uh, expensive centralized database. So. What does a blockchain not do? It's not really cheap, it's not really fast, and it's not really effective. It is cheap, fast, and effective if you compare it uh, with a 40 years old legacy database where a lot of uh, men work, people work is, is uh, needed, uh, but modern automated centralized databases, SQL databases, are usually cheaper, faster, and more effective than a blockchain. So these are not the great advantages of blockchain. The advantages is that it is secure, it is immutable, and it solves the problem of trust.